Well, hello again. Scott Sager with you here, RTC TV4. Of course, we're back with another political interview as we're in the season, so to speak. The primary is coming up May 8th here in Fulton County. And I want to encourage everyone to get out there and cast your vote, whether you're a Republican or Democrat. Today we've got another gentleman here, and he'll be familiar to many of you in the community. This is Greg Heller. He is the, currently the Fulton County Attorney, correct? That is correct. Okay, and he is running for Superior Court Judge here in Fulton County. So uh, welcome to the studio today. Thanks, Scott. It's, Glad the justice to come and do this. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. You know, the point of this is to inform you, the viewer, about all of the candidates that are going to be on your ballot. We've had quite a few come in this year, and we're happy to do that. But today we've got Greg in the hot seat, so to speak. So, here we go. So you were running on the Republican ticket for Superior Court Judge in Fulton County. You were unopposed in the primary, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So um, talk to us about your legal career. Were you originally from Rochester? Did you move here after graduating school? Talk to us a little bit about Greg. Okay. Well, I actually took kind of a non-traditional approach okay. to the law profession. I was actually born and raised in Fort Wayne. Okay. Graduated in high school in 78, attended IU and graduated IU in 1982. We call that God's country, yeah. by the way. Indiana University. I don't <laughs> think I have to uh, identify it any more than right, that. Right, right. Um, but when I got out of college, and although I always kind of wanted to go to law school, I also wanted to get out and work. Mm -hmm. And I took a position with North American Band Lines, who had their national headquarters in Fort Wayne. Okay. In fact, they actually live. They were headquartered right across the highway from my parents' house oh, no on kidding. Highway 30. And it was in Fort Wayne that I actually met my wife, who was born and raised in Rowan, Indiana, but she had just graduated from Indiana State University okay. and was working as a social worker in Fort Wayne. Nice. And I met her. And we ended up, I got promoted up to Madison, Wisconsin. Okay. And now that is a wonderful place yes, to be promoted to. I'm not going to lie about that. <laughs> and... Uh, we were married, got promoted to Madison, Wisconsin, and then when we decided to start our family, mm -hmm. because both of us were from Indiana, we wanted to come back here to Indiana. Okay. So we moved back, and I, when I met my wife, I knew that I wanted to live in a small town. Okay. She had grown up in a small town, I had grown up in a large city, and I knew that. So we settled back into her hometown of Berlin. Her parents uh, have a trailer manufacturing business. I okay. started working for them. And then, for some reason, when we had our two daughters, and they were two and one, that's when I decided, hey, this would be a good time to go to law school. <laughs> it's not the recommended route, right. but I worked full-time during the day, yeah. um, and then I commuted four hours a night down in Indianapolis, wow. attended Indiana University Law School at in Indianapolis. Okay. It's the Robert McKinney Law School uh -huh. now. Did that year-round for four years. Coming out of law school, I knew that I wanted to practice in a small town. That mm -hmm. has always been my vision of what an attorney was, kind of a 21st century Atticus Finch. Yes. And uh, so I interviewed... Look that up for all of you who don't know Atticus Finch. <laughs> yeah, you got to watch... you got to read To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> yes, you and do. then you also have got to watch the movie yeah. To Kill a Mockingbird because it stars Gregory Peck. And my mom named me after Gregory Peck. Are you kidding? That's that is great. no lie. Oh, what a great story. <laughs> so, Good. So I interviewed uh, different spots. And I was prepared to take a position in Huntington, and then I, I interviewed here in Rochester and was offered a position and fell in love with nice. uh, Rochester. And the good thing about working like in the corporate world mm -hmm. and working prior to going to law school right out of high school was I had a real clear sense of what I wanted. Yes. I wanted to be comfortable with where I was living. Sure. I wanted to be comfortable with who I was working with. And I had all that here in Rochester. So I've been practicing in Rochester now for 20 years. Wow. And I moved my family here uh, 18 years ago. Okay. Um, and both my daughters, we have, and they're 26 and 24 now, but they okay. attended elementary school here, middle school here, high school here. Uh -huh. So we're very vested, you know, in the community here, both family-wise and practice-wise, because I've had a private practice mm -hmm. for 20 years. And you had mentioned that I'm the county attorney, mm -hmm. and I have been for 18 years, but... That's just one part of a one lot of different of facets yeah. of what I do. Now you uh, also, I don't know if you're currently the Fulton County Public Library's attorney. We do. Mm -hmm. I'm more their legal, represent, mm -hmm. legal representative. I've never charged uh, for the work that I do for the library, yeah. and that's not uncommon. I do a lot of... Pro bono. The, yes. And when it comes to like entities like the library, mm -hmm. that's just that's good stuff. Yes. Yes. That's just very good stuff. 
And then in my private practice, because I've got a lot of private clients, but I always try to keep one or two pro bono cases on the calendar. Sure. Um, because I look at our profession, we are very graced in the legal profession as being basically given a monopoly. Mm -hmm. And with that, it's, it's giving back. Sure. And so yeah, I've absolutely. always looked at my, my pro bono work as part of giving back, like at my private client level. Sure. And then on my, and I represent a lot of different government entities, and most all of those are contracted mm -hmm. business. But I've always looked at that work as being um, giving back to the community too, in the sense that I'm tied into the issues mm -hmm. that are going on in the community, you know, as serving like the county attorney mm -hmm. and the plan commission attorney and the library, and, um, and I've represented different towns. You just, understand what's going on yeah you definitely keep your, your pulse on the finger of the community exactly through right. those actions yeah so, very interesting well first of all I, I want to go back just a second I want to thank your wife for all of the hard work <laughs> she had to do while you were working a full-time job and commuting down in Indianapolis I've, I have often said my wife had the tougher gig yeah yeah I bet she did <laughs> because she was also at that time raising our two girls but she also operated a uh, antique store in Rowan oh my god um, and a lot of people might remember that. And so I would be gone, well, every night. I'd yeah. get up at, go to work at 6, work till 2, shower, drive down to Indy, get back about 10 or 11. And then on the weekends, I would I would study. Sure. And then my wife, my mother would come from Fort Wayne to watch the girls so Trina could actually be in the store without having <laughs> right. Corinne and Kelsey around. So, <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, yeah. Trina had the tougher gig. Oh, that's great, though. <laughs> and, you know, behind every good man, there's a great woman. And behind every great woman, there's a great mother. It's it's a partnership. <laughs> it, it truly is. But that's great. Um, now, Superior Court Judge, is that the next logical step? Is there something that drew you into wanting to run this time around? That is a great question, because I will tell you that I did not get into the law profession wanting to be a judge. Okay. I truly got into the law profession in that I wanted to help real people with real problems. Mm -hmm. And that's, like I said, that's always been my vision of what a lawyer was. Um, and I've been practicing 20 years now. I will tell you that the last, probably the last two years is where I really started thinking about okay. being judge. And that probably coincides as I started a spiritual journey and I don't want to get go off track with this sure but that did coincide with that mm -hmm. I feel now that uh, I was ready professionally okay. that I've been doing uh, this work in a lot of different areas mm -hmm. um, because my private practice is every criminal and civil type of cases I've got the broad you know the broad uh, knowledge and experience in all those different practice areas so where I felt comfortable professionally mm -hmm. to be able to do that and then more importantly and this kind of ties in with the spiritual journey is that I feel like I can do good from the bench right and, I, and I'd like to think that I've done good with my clients mm -hmm. at the private practice level and I think now I can do good from the bench and hopefully do good for the community great great so. well, well that's excellent well we've heard nothing but uh, good things and uh, we expect nothing but the best now I expect that you're going to be victorious in this this primary. I'm going to predict it right now. <laughs> well, my mom voted, so I think I'm... <laughs> You've already won. But see, that's the other thing. My mom moved here, too, after oh, no my kidding. dad passed away. Over from so Fort that Lane? shows you how yeah. you know everybody falls in love with Rochester once they get here. Yeah, so. absolutely. Well, it's a great community. So, yeah, mom voted, and she put me over the top, so thanks, Mom. Uh, appreciate that's, that. That's great. Well, <laughs> Greg, um, you know, we look forward to hearing more from you. Of course, we'll redo a bunch of interviews as we prep for the... Um, the actual election in November, non-primary election. But um, what else would you like to tell the viewers today about you, your career, your campaign, your platform, your thoughts? Well, I guess two things. Uh, from my practice area, what I would say is, um, I, I mentioned I practice in a lot of different areas. I think the importance of knowing that, you know, that I've done you know, civil, criminal, and when I say civil, all sorts of civil, mm -hmm. civil, including family law, yes, all the divorces, all the custodies, all the guardianships, adoptions, um, but then also, you know, estates, estate administrations, estate planning, um, and then I do have, you know, do a lot of municipal work, mm -hmm. and the municipal work, what, what I want your viewers to understand by having that type of experience mm -hmm. is that 
all of those different practice areas present different personalities mm -hmm. and different legal issues. And from that, I feel like I've got the experience to deal with every type of situation that's going to come through that court. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, not just understanding the type of case, but understanding the people mm -hmm. and what goes on behind their problems. Sure. Because I see the role of a judge, or one of the key components of the role of the judge, is having empathy yes. with the folks that come into their court. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'd like your viewers to understand about my experience with my practice. Now, for what I want to do on the bench, mm -hmm. um, it's important to understand we have two courts. We have the circuit court, and Judge Lee is the judge, presiding judge there, and we have the Superior Court. Mm -hmm. Judge Steele is the presiding judge there, and he's retiring. Between those two courts, each court handles both civil and criminal cases. Okay. They're, they're courts of what's called general jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the the way the the practice areas, the caseloads are distributed between yeah. those two courts result in the superior court having the higher criminal caseload. Okay. Because all the misdemeanors are going through the superior court. Okay. Felonies are alternated between circuit and superior. Okay. So there's a huge criminal caseload mm -hmm. in the superior court. Now, I'm sure everybody's heard about the jail overcrowding issue. Sure, in Fulton County. Yes, and that's not unique to Fulton County. Right. Every county's experiencing that for various, for various reasons, mm -hmm. one of them being legislative from the sure. state. And what I'm about to say isn't to say this is going to deal with the overcrowding issue, although I think it can help it. Mm -hmm. But there's things that I want to, to fully implement within the Superior Court sentencing. And keep in mind, a judge has got to be impartial. Mm -hmm. He's got to be independent. Got to decide cases based upon that specific case, those facts, mm -hmm. that law. <clears throat> but... And I'd like to do make sure that that's being done mm -hmm. uh, in all cases, obviously, but uh, especially in criminal cases, because in criminal cases, the judge has a lot of discretion as to how to sentence. Okay. Um, so sentencing doesn't have to be just incarceration right. or probation. You want to look at alternatives. Exactly. I think we, we have to look at all the alternative sentencings because that's what we should be doing as a judge mm -hmm. in each case. Yeah. Because the person that comes in front of the judge, and let's say they do have a substance abuse issue, mm -hmm. and let's face it, most of our problems in this county are substance abuse issues. And mental health them, issues sure. that tend to be substance abuse yes. issues. And I think it's incumbent upon the judge to look at that situation and say, well, wait a minute, what's the crime? What's the criminal history? Mm -hmm. What's got them here? Mm -hmm. What's going to try to help the situation? And if that means, you know, some treatment, mm -hmm. well, then let's do some treatment. Mm -hmm. Or if we got a case where somebody's got a job, you know, for 20, 30 years at the same place, but maybe they got a drinking problem, mm -hmm. um, then what can we do to address the drinking problem, keep their job? Mm -hmm. um, and then always recognizing that sometimes there's got to be a restraint on freedom. Right. You know, sometimes there just has to be for yes. whatever the reason can be. But we can do more things with work release, mm -hmm. you know, to, 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 to deal with, again, that specific case sure. with that specific problem. And I want to explore all of those options. Excellent. Um, Excellent. And I think that's, that's not, not only what a judge should be doing mm -hmm. in every case, but it's what's fair. Mm -hmm. And I think it's what's going to help the community. Right. By helping the individual in the right way, you better the community exactly. overall. Mm -hmm. Very good. I mean, a key, one of the things I'd like to, to see be accomplished is to start a drug court. Okay. And I went up to Kosciuszko County. Judge Reed has, uh, operates drug court up there. Okay. And drug court, it's not a free pass for right. folks with drug issues. In fact, it's the last step before a long sentence in the DOC. Okay. Um, it is where they are actually sentenced for the crimes that mm -hmm. they have committed. Mm -hmm. And those tend to be long prison sentences mm -hmm. in the Department of Corrections. But we're going to give you the chance. We're going to give you some real intensive type of treatment. Mm -hmm. You're going to show up in court every week. You're going to talk with the judge one-on-one. -on -one, mm -hmm. And we're going to find out, are, are you serious about trying to make a change right. in your life right. to break this cycle? If you are... We're going to give you that. We're going to give you that chance, mm -hmm. and you're not going to go to the DOC. You complete the drug court, then you finish things out in probation. Mm -hmm. But what I have seen in my experience, 
because I have been practicing for 20 years. I used to represent the Divis Division of Family and Children back when they used to have uh, contracted attorneys. Mm -hmm. And I have seen those children removed from homes from abuse and neglect. Now I've, I've seen them then in the juvenile system in my private practice representing juveniles. Right. I've now seen them in the criminal justice system or the adult criminal system in my practice in criminal law. And now I've seen their children coming right back. So what you're seeing is a cycle. The cycle. And what I think is a key component is we need to break the cycle. Mm -hmm. And I say constantly, I'm not a Pollyanna. I don't wear rose-colored glasses. Mm -hmm. But if we have 20 people in drug court, and we have two truly successes, mm -hmm. well, that's two families that we've that's broken the cycle. That's absolutely right. It's not just a, it's not just a percentage it's actually two exactly. human beings and the ripple effects to them and their loved ones. Exactly. Make that difference right. because then that's breaking the cycle. And I'll tell you what, and you and I talked about this before we even started this interview. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we're seeing with the, you know, with the drug problem that we have, mm -hmm. and let's face it, the too big or methamphetamine and heroin, mm -hmm. you know, what we have to realize that is a symptom. Mm -hmm. It's a symptom of society. Yes, it's it a is. symptoms of communities. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think that's a symptom of value breakdown, mm -hmm. family breakdown, mm -hmm. and we got to start. We got to we got to deal with it up here because mm -hmm. these are the cases. Yep. But if we're really going to try to make a difference, we got to try to get to the root problem. That's great. And, but that's a community effort. Yeah. That's not just at the justice level. No, I get it. I get it. And I, I love the approach, and I love the, the thinking there. Um, it is a holistic. I, you talked about your wife studying social work. I studied social work down at IU, uh, my first go-round, if you will. And the cycle is what we talked about constantly. Mm -hmm. At some point, you're going to have generation after generation after generation after generation repeating the same cycle. Um, and you'll see that both on, let's call it the successful and the unsuccessful Absolutely. families and people out there is that it, they tend to replicate. Yep. And if you can interject somewhere in there and just stop that cycle and start anew, and sometimes you start anew with the adult and sometimes you start anew just by working with the, the child when they're younger. But uh, I like the approach and I appreciate your view on that for sure. Well, Greg Heller, I've gotten to know him a little bit more here today. I hope you have as well. He is on the ticket uh, this May 8th, and that will be for Superior Court Judge on the Republican ticket in Fulton County. If uh, you have more to know about or need to know more about um, Greg, please feel free to go to a website or oh, Facebook absolutely. or what do you have? You can you can call my office, okay, and I'll be more than happy to talk to you. Excellent, excellent. And, uh, it's Heller Law Office, and yeah. we've been 320 East 8th Street. Well, they've got a so. RTC phone, so uh, you're welcome to give them a call there. Oh, yeah, and I, you know, I just appreciate more talking to people face yeah. to face, and so that'd be the best way. And I'd be Excellent. more than happy to answer any questions. Well, we love accessibility. We've talked about that in every interview. Is that accessibility to your government officials, to those that are serving, is is just desperately important, and we appreciate yeah. you being open to that. And I like the person. Per we talked about that we too. We did too. The too too much electronic communication. We need to get back to talking one on one. One on one. Well. Again, I want to thank you for coming. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time here on RTC TV4. Thank you, Scott. Thank you.